people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Persecution of Hazara Shias continues in Pakistan with the killing of coal miners. Pakistan arrests 2611 mastermind and LET commander Zakir Rehman Lakhvi. And India starts UN Security Council term going to speak against terror. The Hazara community has suffered discrimination, persecution and massacres because of their ethnicity and Shiite faith in predominantly Sunni Muslim countries. In Pakistan, this persecuted minority survives the trauma caused by extremist Sunni groups who target them on a regular basis. In the most recent case, 11 coal miners belonging to this vulnerable community were mercilessly killed by gunmen in the province of Balochistan. A report. These are the visuals of Hazara Shiite community staging sit-in protest by placing bodies of their loved ones. The gathering of mourning people around the dead bodies is itself telling the story of their endless persecution. This recent attack claimed by Islamic State killed 11 miners from minority Shiite Hazaras in Balochistan province. The attack is not the first time that the Hazaras have been targeted by extremist outfits in Balochistan. In the last few years, hundreds of Hazaras have been killed in suicide bomb attacks and targeted killings. और अफसोसनाक वाकया हुआ है कुछ अरसे दो तीन साल थोड़ा बहुत अमन से गुजरा और हुकूमत के भी दावा थे कि हमारी रिट खाई में लेकिन कल का कल रात का जो वाकया हुआ है ये इसने साबित किया है कि हुकूमत बिल्कुल गाफिल है हुकूमत इन देशदर्दों को कंट्रोल करने में नाकाम रही है और हजारा कौम इस पर इतजाज करने का हक महफूज रखती है और इसके जिम्मेदार मरकजी हुकूमत और सुबाई हुकूमतें दोनों हैं Although Islamic State has taken responsibility for this brutal crime, this vulnerable minority group is facing threats also from the other terror outfits in Pakistan. According to Pakistan's National Commission of Human Rights, more than 2,000 Hazaras have been killed in Pakistan in the last 15 years. It is believed that Lashkari Jangwe is responsible for most of these killings. Though Pakistan's ISI has termed Lashkar-e Jangwi as one of the most virulent terrorist organizations, evidence still suggests that the state continues to support it. This outfit uses madrasas to run its terror against the Hazaras. Terrorists belonging to this group not only conduct physical attacks against Hazaras, but also direct threatening and hateful slogans at the community. Most of the similar terror outfits are run by Sunni Muslim hardliners and this is the reason why Pakistan government and ISI try to avoid confrontation at all costs and on many occasions they even support these groups. We should not forget that Ahmadis were declared non-Muslims by the Pakistani government to placate its conservative Sunni supporters. These और हजारा कम्युनिटी को बतदरीज जो है वो टारगेट किया गया है हजारा कम्युनिटी का बकायदा जेनोसाइड किया जा रहा है बलूचिस्तान में पाकिस्तान आर्मी की तरफ से और हजारों की तादाद में जो हजारा हैं इनको अब तक हलाक किया जा चुका है बसें रोकी जाती हैं उनमें से शनाख्त की जाती है हजारों की उनको उतारा जाता है उनको गोली मारी जाती है और इस सवाले से बे बहुत इतजाज हुआ है बलूचिस्तान में कोटा में 
ہزارہ کمیونٹی نے احتجاج کیا ہے لیکن کسی نے ان کی نہیں سنی ٹائم اینڈ اگین ہیومن رائٹ ایکٹیوسٹ ہیو اکیوزڈ پاکستانی گورنمنٹ اینڈ آرمی آف فیسیلیٹیٹنگ دا جینوسائڈ آف ہزارہ کمیونٹی ٹو ڈے آفٹر ایئرز آف سسٹمیٹک پرسیکیوشن آف ہزاراز ان پاکستان دا کمیونٹی ہیز بین ریڈیوز ٹو لیونگ ان ٹو گیٹوز ان پاکستان بلوچستان ماری آباد اینڈ ہزارہ ٹاؤن دیئر ڈسٹنکٹ فزیکل فیچرز انکریز دا رسک آف پرسیکیوشن ایوری ٹائم they go out of their designated settlement areas. This vulnerable community, which faces public discrimination by being referred to as heretics, is demanding justice on roads after the killing of coal miners. With their anti-terror slogans and strong protest, these people want their voices heard, but it seems that no one is paying heed to them. Recent violent incidents against Hazaras show that Pakistan has not taken any meaningful action to prevent the never-ending persecution of the minority Shia sect and despite a shocking history of Hazara persecution in Pakistan, the international outcry is muted. Reeling under the immense pressure from India and the global terror financing watchdog, the FATF, Pakistan has once again staged a new theatrics in one of its so-called anti-terrorism court. Following the sham arrest of Hafiz Saeed last week, Imran Khan government has now been forced to arrest 26-11 Mumbai terror attack mastermind Zakir Rahman Lakhvi for terror financing. However, the observers have termed it a farce. They call it Islamabad's another tactical move aimed at building up its case before the Financial Action Task Force that has kept it in its grill list since 2018. Mumbai attack mastermind and lashkar e taibas operations commander Zakir Rahman Lakhvi has once again been falsely paraded by his masters in Pakistan. Nearly five years after he was released on bail in the 26-11 Mumbai attacks case, Lakhvi was arrested in Pakistan by its counter-terrorism department amidst growing global pressure on Islamabad to bring terror leaders residing in the country to justice. He was allegedly running a dispensary using funds collected for terrorism financing and further using those funds for personal expenses and terrorism. However, this move by Pakistan is nothing but eyewash to fool the international community as it comes just ahead of meetings of the Global Watchdog Financial Action Task Force in January and February, which will consider Pakistan's greyless status. The arrest of Lakhvi by the Pakistani authorities is certainly an attempt to um, fool, I will say, to fool the FATF. Now the next FATF hearing is uh, going to be held in February and Pakistan is desperate to get out of the grey list. India on the other hand feels that adequate work has not been done by Pakistan and they should be put on the blacklist but that blacklist is not going to happen. And uh, uh, the possibilities are that Pakistan will either remain on the grey list or be taken off the grey list. Zakir Rahman Lakhvi has been enjoying VIP treatment from Pakistan's establishment since the time he was released in 2015. Even the time he spent in a Pakistani jail was just a sham as he had access to all facilities, held his meetings with people from outside and had even fathered a child while at the Adiala jail in Rawalpindi. Pakistan's duplicity doesn't end here. In December, Imran Khan's government pleaded before United Nations Security Council on behalf of Lakhvi. The UNSC on request of the Pakistani government allowed the payment of 1.5 lakh Pakistani rupees to Lakhvi every month. Pakistan claimed that Lakhvi needed this amount for his personal expenses. However, it is well understood that access to finance is aimed at smoothing out the terror activities commanded by these terror leaders. What had happened was that certain bank accounts had been, uh, uh, had been closed by Pakistan and by the international authorities. Now, uh, they wanted, uh, the Pakistani authorities wanted some payment to be made because these are accounts which were being controlled by Lakhvi. And uh, they put up a 
a, a statement that uh, this person requires it for his personal use. Now, actually, all this is simply a facade because um, uh, it's, it, shows, it shows in very clear terms the hypocrisy of the Pakistani state when it comes to dealing with terrorism. Uh, organizations like the Lashkar-e Taiba have been uh, sponsored and set up by the Pakistani state. The UN-designated terrorist was behind the 2611 Mumbai massacre when Lashkar-e Taiba terrorists from Pakistan created mayhem in the city on his direction. However, Pakistan has not only maintained silence over his involvement, but has worked overtime to conceal his role in the bloodshed. David Coleman Headley, a Pakistani-American spy who conspired in plotting the attack, admitted before U.S. authorities that Lakhvi was the planner and the facilitator of 2611 attacks. Moreover, Ajmal Kassab, the lone gunman captured in India, also named Lakhvi as his handler. Another culprit of Mumbai attacks, Abu Jundal also conceded that Lakhvi was giving directions to 10 heavily armed terrorists operating in Mumbai. India's dossiers to Pakistan also established his role in providing money and logistics to carry out the Mumbai massacre. However, Pakistan has turned a blind eye towards all the pieces of evidence against Lakhvi. After the Mumbai attacks, every single bit of proof was given to the Pakistani authorities, uh, which very, very clearly indicated the uh, involvement of both Hafiz Saeed and Lakhvi. Now, uh, it is not simply a question of um, uh, uh, oral evidence. There is technical evidence to support these claims. But Pakistan has refused to accept any of this. So there is, uh, there is total hypocrisy on the part of Pakistan when it deals with terrorism. Whenever Pakistan has faced a decision on its grey list status, it has carried out similar actions that appear to be aimed more at ensuring a better outcome for itself at the FATF. Its arrest and conviction of Hafiz Saeed and other lashkar e taiba leaders in terror financing cases, the passing of anti-terrorism and money laundering laws in Pakistan Assembly to bring them in line with FATF-mandated international norms, and the publication of new lists of terrorists at various times, all time before FATF reviews of Pakistan's status. And now, Lakhvi's arrest narrates the same story. But will this arrest lead to real indictment and prosecution? Or is it yet another bogus move to get away with any serious action by terror financing watchdog FATF in future? Only time will tell. At every global forum, India has always condemned terrorism in all its forms. Recently, India began its term as an elected member of the UN Security Council with the stated objective of raising its voice against this enemy of humanity. Speaking at a special flag installation ceremony, the country's permanent representative to the UN, T.S. Tirumurthy, asserted that India will use its term on the UN Security Council to bring inclusive solutions to the matters of global peace and security. Our report. The new year marks a new beginning for India at the Global Forum. India starts its term as a non-permanent member of the powerful 15-nation UN organ for the 2021-2022 term. After a brief ceremony of flag installation, country's permanent representative to UN, T.S. Tirumurthy restarted India's commitment to raise voice against terrorism. He said that India will not shy away from raising voice against the common enemies of humanity like terrorism. The country will use its tenure on the UN Security Council to bring human-centric and inclusive solutions to matters of global peace and security. He further added that peacekeeping, peace building, maritime security, women and youth, especially in conflict situations, and technology with a human face will receive India's attention while on the 15-nation council. We will use our tenure to bring human-centric and inclusive solutions to matters of international peace and security, 
India will be a voice for the developing world. We will not shy away from raising our voice against the common enemies of humanity like terrorism. Peacekeeping, peace building, maritime security, women and youth, especially in conflict situations, and technology with a human face will receive our attention while on the council. In June, New Delhi had declared that India will strive to achieve a concrete and result-oriented action at the Security Council for an effective response to international terrorism. India has been asked to chair three important committees of the Security Council, which includes Taliban Sanctions Committee, Counter-Terrorism Committee and the Libyan Sanctions Committee. I'm happy to announce that India has been asked to chair three important committees of the Security Council, which include the Taliban Sanctions Committee, Counter-Terrorism Committee and the Libyan Sanctions Committee. Now, as a non-permanent member, India could push for an effective response to global terrorism, abuse of information and technology by terrorists, disrupting their nexus with sponsors, lowering the flow of terror financing and strengthening the cooperation with other multinational forums. It could work to enhance global action against countries which are safe havens for terrorists by seeking the streamlining of the process of putting sanctions on terrorists and terrorist entities. And to achieve this, India needs to work for depoliticization of the process of sanctioning as there is no justification of any act of terrorism. It is a very good opportunity for India to pursue the agenda of a Comprehensive Convention of International Terrorism, CCIT, which has been proposed to the United Nations by the country many decades back. Somehow this has not been able to gain momentum. And due to this, there is also prevalence of cross-border terrorism, proxy terrorism, particularly by Pakistan, which has been waged in India and in other countries such as Afghanistan as well. By pursuing the CCIT, I think India can really make a difference in countering terrorism across the globe. India can now more strongly call on the international community to take verifiable actions against terror outfits operating in Pakistan and urge its neighbor to introspect about why it is universally acknowledged as the international epicenter of terrorism as well as a safe havens for terrorists. India's suggestions in UN should be responded positively as it remains a victim of cross-border terrorism for decades. As when the issue of terrorism is being raised by India in the Security Council, hundreds of armed terrorists are waiting across the line of control to infiltrate into Jammu and Kashmir. Moving on, as the negotiations between Afghan government and the insurgent group are taking place after a three-week pause, the United States and the Taliban have got caught up in the blame game over alleged violations of U.S.-Taliban agreement. Meanwhile, Afghan civilians and security forces continue to suffer from the brunt of a high level of violence by the Taliban. A report. Afghanistan is the longest war in the history of America. The United States began a war in 2001 with an aim to rid the country of Al-Qaeda's threat and topple the Taliban's regime weeks after the Al-Qaeda killed almost 3,000 people in the 9-11 terror attacks. Nearly 20 years later, the US and its allies are struggling to maintain peace and to end deadly attacks by the Taliban. However, the war is showing no signs of slowing down. The second round of peace talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban are taking place in Doha amid a row between the US and the insurgent group over alleged violation of US-Taliban peace deal. The United States has directly accused the Taliban of being behind a recent wave of high-profile assassinations in Afghanistan, urging the insurgent group to stop the violence for peace to succeed. At the same time, the Taliban has blamed the U.S. military of carrying out airstrikes against the insurgent group. 
However, the US has termed all such claims as bogus. This is the first time Washington has blamed the Taliban for weeks of largely unacclaimed attacks in the war-torn nation. The United States accusing the Taliban of uh, carrying out killings, etc., can be viewed in a number of ways. First is the United States has finally started to acknowledge, which everybody knew, that the Taliban were not negotiating in good faith and that the United States was going with this deal for the Taliban so that they would have a face-saving way out. The other way to look at it is the following, that the Taliban now, the nature of the Taliban's killings have changed. What they are indulging is, is not random killings, but certain high-profile targeted killings which have a strategic aim to put fear into the lives of all those forces who in a supposedly joint government could be critics of the Taliban. The negotiations between the Afghan government and the Taliban group, which started in September to find a peaceful solution to Afghanistan's prolonged crisis, have yet to bear results, while the security situation in the country continues to worsen. The two sides only agree to the rules and procedures for future talks, while no discussion on a ceasefire had taken place. So, as round two is beginning, there are some key obstacles that need to be addressed. The Afghan government envisions a pluralistic and democratic society in Afghanistan, where people elect the head of the state and the state guarantees equal rights to citizens and protects minorities. However, for the Taliban, identity and legitimacy are based on a theocratic and totalitarian form of governance. Now, the second round is expected to address such fundamental issues, including an agreement on comprehensive ceasefire, the form of state that Afghanistan should have, and a transitional governing arrangement for a post-peace deal. First is the nature of the Afghan government. The Afghan government is yet not getting its act together. The constituent factions of the Afghan government are still not coming to terms to the fact uh, uh, that the, uh, if they are not united, if they don't have a coherent strategy, their survival will be in doubt. The second and the most obvious um, uh, fact and possibly the most important fact is the Taliban backed by Pakistan is not negotiating in good, uh, good uh, faith and the Americans are for a long time have refused to acknowledge this particular fact. But what matters most for Afghans is the kind of peace deal that comes out of these negotiations. There are apprehensions that a compromise with the Taliban will endanger the gains achieved since 2001, including women's rights, the protection of minorities and freedom of expression. The Afghan peace process is fragile, but its failure may lead to more conflict and misery for the country. Thus, it is an opportunity, and if it progresses well, it can pave a path to durable peace. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shreya Savijay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.